It's time now for the Sports Objective Podcast. No talking heads, just guys who love sports. Here's Dave Richmond. Welcome into the Sports Objective Podcast. I'm Dave Richmond, along with my good buddy Kyle McGrady's Barber. What's up, man? Good on, dude. We approach week zero of college football 48 hours out. The money man, Kyle from McGrady. I don't know about Barber. that. By the way, by the way, I just want to tell you, I just remember this. I actually met a lady the other day at my work. You met a lady? And she was from Jason, North Carolina, ladies and gentlemen. So, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> So it's all relative, my friend. Anyway, how are you, Bubba Rosenbaum, in the western part of the state? Doing well. Uh, opening night for high school football tomorrow. Uh, if the weather will allow a lot of teams to get it in, and uh, like like Kyle said, uh, week zero, so ready to watch the, the Florida Miami game on Saturday night. Arizona Hawaii also. By the way, guys, I, I have to say, there's uh, <clears throat> my kids. We've got some actual. Um, those TV, 32-inch TVs from Walmart for $118. I was like, man, I could get a whole bunch of those for my future man cave. Whenever I have a man cave, I'm going to get a whole bunch of those TVs because $118 for a TV now is incredible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they've, come, they've come down quite a bit as, uh, as flat screen, HD, LCD technology has evolved. And the Roku built in. I mean, are you kidding me? Good stuff there where you can put a whole bunch of sports apps on there and Speaking of which, uh, hey, I want to get did, your... uh, did did you did we get a major sponsorship from Walmart? And you're not sharing this with us. No, I, I usually okay. don't mention. I just make you sure. guys always mention that I'm in Walmart, so I just um, want to make sure. I need to... Bentonville, Arkansas. <laughs> we need to go down there and say, look, yo, we wait. We've named Walmart way too many times oh, in our good. podcast, and you owe us money. Um, no, it, the uh, the TVs though are a great deal, and um, my kids are thrilled that they have a. TV now at their grandparents' house, so in their bedroom there. So um, I did a good deal. Dave, your, your dad's a vet. And he's struggling to buy a TV. No, I was actually getting one for them because uh, they're actually the room. We actually cleaned it out. They're tick- they're going to have a themed room and everything, so it's going to be really cool. So all right. Anyway, I didn't want to go down that path too much, but uh, one more question for you guys. Uh, one and a half for you, and that is. For Chinese food, um, yeah, what is your? Some. I just had some. What is right. your? What is your go-to? Do you have like a go-to meal, or do you? Uh, are there things on the menu? I'm going to ask you this real quick for both of you, and then we'll talk some football. Chung Pao chicken would be my favorite. Love it with the spices with peanuts. It's great. Love it. Uh, I'm also a big fan of of egg rolls or spring rolls. Yeah. Um, Mandarin chicken. I love Mandarin chicken. Uh, uh, I'm also a, a, a big fan of uh, the steamed dumplings. Oh my um, God, we my kids love those. Uh, yeah. Mugu guy pans, another favorite of mine. Um, and then if we're gonna if we're gonna stick on the Asian cuisine, but dive you know go away from Chinese food. Uh, something going on at your house, Dave? Yeah, the kids are going crazy, but you know. Makes yeah, and, uh, and, and then I and then I enjoy Thai food a lot. Uh, pad Thai is a cool <laughs> classic, and uh, things like that. Yeah. yeah, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'd say. Uh, Bubba, gen- what about you? Yeah, General So's chicken and uh, sesame chicken, orange chicken. Uh, I'll that's what. Um, those are some of my favorites, and then um, like Kyle said, love love the egg rolls, fried rice. Right. What I have a, get into this podcast. No, I wanted I wanted to ask you guys that because uh, one thing that drives me crazy is just simply um, it seems a lot of times you go to I, I like a I guess what I like about restaurants I'll say this really quick I love atmosphere and I remember growing up there was a restaurant my mom's parents my grandparents took me to it was this really cool Chinese restaurant sit down like dim lit it was like yeah. mm-hmm. what it should, I love that kind of but it doesn't seem like there's many places like that anymore that you can go to. Dave, come over, come over uh, here uh, sometime when you when you when you get when you got a little extra time to Lagrange. Okay. And uh, me and Jessica will take you out over to Goldsboro and take you to our favorite Chinese place. It's called China House. It's been there probably 30 years. Um, it's over by the Air Force Base. It's old school. 
everything is served. They, they actually, you remember, you remember a lot of Chinese restaurants, they would push things out on carts and bring it out. Oh, my and, God, I love that. And, and, and serve it. And they give you a serving plate and then give you the plate with the food. Yeah. They still do that there. It's dimly oh, lit, like you're talking about. Uh, you'd love it. Oh, my God. It was a place in Durham. It's no longer there on Hillsborough Road called China Inn. And that's where I got hooked on as a really young boy on – that's the way in my mind that Chinese restaurants should be. So yeah. anyway, I'm not anti. And the food, food quality, the food quality right. is 100 times better at places like that versus the the when you go to the strip mall, the Chinese takeout place at Walmart where everything tastes the same and it right. all tastes cheap. Yeah, it's a totally different thing. You're right. Um, come, come come over here sometime. We'll go to China House uh, uh, there on uh, Berkeley Boulevard, right by the Air Force Base in Goldsboro. Um, and uh, it's great, and they are, and they are also not sponsoring the show, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you would like to sponsor the show, you can yeah. just simply email us at thesportsobj@gmail.com. We'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, if you guys want to advertise on the on the podcast, and uh, like Dave said, email us at thesportsobj@gmail.com. Put it in the subject line, advertise, and uh, we will get back to you. Yeah, he, they'll give us two million dollars. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, inside joke. Anyway, um, guys, I have to say that I'm tickled to death about football period being here. High school, we have college this week, and then football, pro football in a couple weeks. It's just uh, what a beautiful time of year. And um, I'm just, it, it's hard to believe. I think this is the most excited I've been about uh, football season, and especially college football with East Carolina in many years. And I love Ruff and McNeil, but there's something um, even going back, I would say probably, I don't know, maybe uh, Skip Holtz era, the championship years maybe. That's been, uh, I'm that excited. Even I'm not saying we're going to win a championship this year, but it's something about this year that already feels special. Yeah, it's the most excited I've been going into a college football season since going into the 2014 year. Okay, um, that's fair. It, it's, uh, it, it's just knowing that we have a program – that's going to grow. We have a coaching staff that knows what they're doing. You know, you, you listen to Mike Houston in these post-practice interviews, and he gets you so fired up. Things he says, he, he he's no nonsense. He, right. He's not going to – Coach Houston just is not going to accept being bad. No. Um, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But, right. man, it's, he, he gets me fired up. And uh, – mm-hmm. It's fun to see that, that – it just no. I mean, I just – I don't have a, a doubt in my mind that in time Coach Mike Houston is going to win here. Oh, there's no question about it. You look at uh, – and for us, we have a situation now where we can win, I think, a number of games. So, um, by the way, guys, are you going to – here's the question. I'll put you on the spot, an easy one. Are you guys going to the ODU game, Old Dominion? Uh, I, will not, I will not be able to. Uh, Riley has a baseball tournament that day. Um, it's one that I had been considering, but uh, got his baseball schedule here a couple weeks ago, and un- unfortunately his team uh, does have a game that day. Uh, but the good news is that there's only uh, one conflict in terms of home games, uh, so so that's good. I, I am still considering Navy because there is no baseball tournament that weekend. Uh, I've considered it. I, I've even considered about trying to – put in for uh media credentials um but uh probably not but it's still out there as a possibility what about you dave i'm definitely going so i was hoping one of y'all would say they're going but oh you're going uh, okay when did you yeah. say that i've been uh i've been I've, i took off that day um you back when ticket? i was on the schedule no i need tickets so uh, <laughs> yeah, you better get tickets it's gonna sell out yeah. have you thought about just trying to get media cred- a press pass that's what i'm thinking yeah, uh, that may be your best bet because they sell out. Yeah, so I don't think anybody cares I'm going to the game, but I was just curious about that very thing. Hopefully we can get a huge crowd. There's a lot of great people in the 757 that went to East Carolina. We have a um, – by the way, guys, we met at Media Day. Um, well, Kyle, you were there, but uh, Bubba knows as well. The guys, let's give the guys a shout-out from Seven Cities. Uh, they were in the, in the Tidewater area, and – cover i know they cover the pirates and uh, we're going to have them on the podcast and we'll be on their show but uh nice meeting them and great guys and i uh, look forward to that's what's great about um and i'll just say this for the members of the media i can speak for myself but 
generally speaking, members of the media get along with each other, and uh, some people don't, and that's okay. Um, that's their choice, but I don't walk in a room going, I hate that guy. I hate that <laughs> that woman from whatever station or whatever. Right. I've just never been that way. Well, no. I mean, you know, I, I don't either, and I, I don't know any of these people uh, up until now personally. Um, you know, I, I, I've you know had, had a chance to talk to Troy and Cliff and some of the guys at Pirate Radio and uh, obviously uh, Patrick Johnson from 94.3. We like him. In terms of knowing them personally, no, I don't know any of them well enough to 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 have any opinions on them beyond just uh, you know, hey, how you doing, kind of. Um, right. So no, I don't I don't have any ill will towards anybody in the media. Bubba does, but we'll hold that. I won't hold that against yeah. Bubba. Huh? <laughs> yeah, well, but it's hard. It's hard for me to get along with most folks. So that's, he wouldn't that's even pretty... go to media day. I mean, he says screw yeah. those those yeah. fake media assholes. I'm not going. And so he yeah. Show up. yeah, he he held out for more money. Um, so right. Um, but anyway, we had thank you for everybody. Media day, we've had a lot of people. I, yeah, I, you know what I hear? I hear Bob actually wanted two million dollars to show up. Yeah, <laughs> but he did. <laughs> he wouldn't resort to anything. Anyway, um, I will ask you this, guys: uh, Would you ever? We could play that game here, sports wise. So, would you ever? Here's an easy one for you, Kyle. Would you ever pull for North Carolina, North Carolina or slash NC State, if it meant that East Carolina would somehow get into the college football playoff? Of course. Okay, so you're gonna do that? Because yeah, at is, is the, is the end of the day, is pulling for East Carolina. If if somehow, like let's 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 use this in a situation where it would make sense. Let's say, for whatever reason, our bye game in 2022 or wherever it's going to be is Clemson. And, well, no, I don't guess North Carolina beating Clemson would help us get in the playoffs. Yeah. I don't you're going to have to give me a scenario where that helps us. Okay, no, no, well, no. okay, I got it. L- let's say we beat North Carolina, and then North Carolina has a chance to beat Clemson in the mm-hmm. ACC title game, and right. uh, we're undefeated also. And, uh, that win's going to, you know, strengthen us enough to so we make the playoff. Of course I'm going to root for North Carolina in that situation because it benefits East Carolina. I'm sure you would too, Bubba. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's one of those things, like you said, I mean, no, you're not going to pull for those guys, but uh, under certain circumstances, uh, absolutely, because it's, it's pulling for the Pirates. <laughs> so what about you? Because so, I mean, what, why, why would I? Obviously, those those circumstances are are very uh, few and far between. Um, but if, right. if something like that did arise, I mean, it would be a no brainer because because my love of seeing East Carolina succeed um, is is far greater, not even close, um, rather than watching somebody else fail. Yeah, definitely. And we and we. More than likely, we're going to get to that shot where we will definitely be. I, I still believe this under Mike Houston, a New York New Year Six Bowl. Um, I really believe that we're going to get to that height under him. I don't know how long it's going to take. I'm not going to say it. Obviously, it's this year. I'm not crazy, um, but I do believe if you look at the talent that the, I, I'm just blown away is something I don't normally look at. Thank God for Stephen Igo and Mark uh, Lindsay. Those guys are recruiting gurus. Um, they're friends of the podcast. They follow it closely. I'm following it closer because of them. And now when you look at Mike Houston and you're seeing his staff work their tails off and they're getting these guys, oh, my gosh. I mean, they're getting guys that um, that I believe that when they put them all together, um, they're going to be, like I said, multiple 10-win seasons. I really believe that, like, maybe year four or five. I don't know how many years Houston will be here, but – not that it matters right now, but I really believe that Houston will get us to that level where if we lose the game, we'll be pissed. Like, pissed beyond, I'm not saying we don't, not that we like to lose now, but we're just so used to losing now. Um, All right, we're going to get used to winning again where, where a loss is going to piss us off. Um, right. No, I, yeah, I think we'll get back to that level too. Um, as far as, you know, whether we'll make a New Year's Six Bowl, who knows, time will tell, That's you know. Right now, I'd be happy with making the Cure Bowl in Orlando. But, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I hey, mean, 
Speaking of, lo- speaking of losing and the impact it has on you, um, obviously uh, Coach Houston was not a pirate technically yet, I mean, but he was hired very, um, I guess, what, 24 hours, 48 yeah. hours af- after that NC State debacle a season ago where the perfect storm hit and for that 58-3 loss. But Coach Houston this week, a couple of days ago, was talking about that at the press conference actually i think it was uh yesterday was and, uh, yesterday yesterday being wednesday evening um but he was he was talking about it and just saying watching film uh, of that game the cut-ups and the game as a whole just made him absolutely sick to his stomach yeah he said it made him sick to his stomach uh he said it's been a long time since he's been a part of a game like that and he don't plan on going back to that now uh, so there was things in that game that are unacceptable that he will not tolerate, such as lack of effort, not tackling, poor discipline. Uh, you know, things not like coming that. off the football. <laughs> not coming off the football. I mean, it's just he, he said it will not be optional. And uh, you know, he, he's either going to do those things, or he ain't going to play. By the way, uh, Bubba Donnie Kirkpatrick made that statement again. If you if you if you don't block at receiver, you're not going to play. He yeah, I saw that. I thought about you as soon as I saw it. I, I started laughing. He said, hey, "Either you're going to block, or you ain't going to play." Exactly. So uh, nobody coaches coaches uh, receivers to block downfield quite like Donnie K. So, uh, the, one of the plays that I think of most when I when I think of uh, receivers blocking downfield is that that play. I, Let's see. You know, I believe one, uh, a couple plays that come to mind. One was in Blacksburg when uh, there was just a, a play where I'm trying to remember whether it was a throw and a catch. But then you had um, after, after the catch, you had um, or a, a long run, whatever the case was. Cam Worthy making some tremendous blocks downfield, yeah. and then and then also the one where we had like third and thirty. Um, and ran the ran a, like an outside zone play to Breon Allen, and he took it to the house against the Tar Heels, and there was some tremendous downfield blocking on that play um, by, oh, yeah. by by Zay Jones and others. Yeah, it's just the, that's something that we blocked so aggressively. I, I think at times it, it, defenders didn't know how to handle it; they were almost shocked by it. And I would imagine throughout a game, it wears you out yeah. as, as the defender. And yeah. uh, you know you got you see it on tape. You got to prepare for it, and practice against it. I mean, it's just I, I love that kind of that kind of you know, effort, attitude, and play is coming back to East Carolina. No doubt about. It. Hey, uh, by the way, Kyle, we always talk joke, but Mike Tyson always said everybody has a plan until you get in the ring. You know, everybody has a plan until you get in the, on the field, and until you get hit like that, it's uh, it's definitely. Uh, big time, and especially when you look at the, I mean, Bubba, you're the expert here, obviously playing the game, but I mean, when when you break it right down to it, football is a game of blocking and tackling, and that's two things that we haven't been able to do well, and because of that, we've lost a lot of games, period. Drop yeah. the mic. No, no kidding, man. Uh, tackling is something that uh, he, he talked about, we're going to, you know, somebody asked at the, at the uh, post-practice yesterday, do we still have a tackling problem? He said we'll find out next Saturday. I believe that I believe it'll be much improved. They they've been practicing. I mean, my God, every day you see them um, <clears throat> practicing a lot and uh, practicing a lot, <laughs> tackling a lot. Sorry, at practice, and that makes me feel so happy because Bubba, you know, playing the game. If you coach the game, you play the game. Yeah. You know that when you play like you practice, you hear that cliche all the time, but that's the reason why it's a cliche. And that's why when we didn't tackle and we didn't block or do certain things, um, there's one thing that Mike Houston does not like, and he said that he didn't like uh, his team to be uh, last few years as a, a soft team, and that's the way he felt like the team has been and where people are tapping out after a few plays and, they're going just halfway instead of like going live and thud and different uh, drills they have going on. That you can't you can't expect a guy to go out there and and all of a sudden turn on the light bulb will come off. It's like it's kind of a natural knowing you play sports. If you have to think about it, then you're probably not going to be able to be successful. No, yeah, and, and, and you learn how to tackle in practice. Right. Uh, you gotta you gotta 
you got to do it live, as Rick Smith would say. And uh, <laughs> if, 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 you, if you don't do it live in practice, you're not going to be able to do it come game day. Hell, you got to do it live. Thank you, Coach Smith. <laughs> Thank you. We need to get Coach back on, miss him, and uh, think a lot of his daughter, Beth, who is a fan of our podcast, so appreciate yeah. her very much. We have her back on. She's, uh, I tell you what, she's a tough cookie, and you know why? Because of her dad. She uh, definitely is awesome and uh, definitely uh, definitely one that uh, is like him and being a straight shooter. I'm very, by the way, speaking of which, guys, can you talk about this? Because you guys told me before we started recording, what's the deal with the Marshall-Virginia Tech controversy you told me about that was from a few days ago? I'd love to get you Yeah, last, last year it uh, comes out now that uh, there were some Hokies that were seniors who were disappointed in the way the season went that uh, didn't feel like going to a bowl game. Uh, they needed to beat Marshall for bowl eligibility last year, game of the year. They were playing the Thunder and Herd uh, because of our game being canceled against them. And uh, there were some seniors who wanted to throw the ball game and um, kind of lay down. And uh, they decided not to and went ahead and went through with, with effort and trying to win the game and went to a bowl game. And But, uh, you know, <laughs> me, and, me and Bubba were discussing that and, what had that been East Carolina? What have we decided to reschedule that game the last game of the year? And then they did go through with laying down. <laughs> wow. I mean, that could have been Coach Blackwell beating the Hokies in that situation. And Mike Houston maybe would have never been hired. So, yeah. I don't know. It's just a weird thought. Because that could have easily been us playing that game. And, so. and Dave, an exact quote uh, from – from a current Hokie player about that, uh, some of those guys that were involved in that situation have transferred out, uh, not surprisingly. But recently we had the opportunity to catch up with uh, Florida Hall of Famer and SEC Network analyst Chris Doring, and let's talk to him right now. All right, we're just we're 72 hours from kickoff. I'm very excited for the opening weekend of college football in a sense, week zero. And um, the biggest game this weekend is, of course, the matchup between the Florida Gators and the Miami Hurricanes. And now to talk about that matchup, uh, welcome into the show, Florida Hall of Famer and SEC Network Analyst, Chris Doring. Chris, welcome in. Hey, good to be back with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We appreciate your time. I'm very excited about the start of the college football season, and I, I know you are as well. Uh, so just taking a look at this matchup, we're entering year two of the Dan Mullen era. Um, ten wins last year for the Gators, and um, I, I know they're expecting big things in Gainesville this year. And so what can you tell us about the season as, as a whole, and then we'll take a look at this matchup in general. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a situation where, yeah, clearly Dan Mullen came in and, and turned things around probably quicker than he did, just probably underutilized and underdeveloped. So uh, they won a lot of close games last year and, and uh, had some things go their way. But uh, I think the expectation level is obviously very high, and people feel like that uh, they got the right guy, which is, is important. So uh, one of the things that I worry about is, is knowing that this team has such a difficult schedule this year with uh, – Miami at the at the top of the schedule and finishing from Florida State at the end, drawing LSU and Auburn from the West and playing an improved Eastern Division uh, from top to bottom. So it can very well be a team uh, that that is better and doesn't necessarily doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily reflect the the, the improvement in the win loss column. Absolutely. Um... That's what that's one of the things that really jumped out to me as well. I'm um, looking at the the Gator schedule and um, that's what taking a look at last year. That's what one of the things that really jumps off the page. I know um, it didn't necessarily start the best, but as the season wore on, the development of Felipe Franks and um, that's what he ended up finishing the year with a 24 to six uh, touchdown to interception ratio and. Uh, Obviously, Dan Mullen is someone uh, a lot of folks refer to him as the quarterback whisperer, so maybe we shouldn't be that surprised. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why he was hired to, to come to Gainesville was, one, uh, because of his ability to, to coach up quarterbacks. I mean, he's had a, a wide array of quarterbacks from the time that he's been at Mississippi State, and even before as he's been a, a coordinator throughout college football, is that he he's able to take guys and and fit the scheme around them rather than trying to, to make a guy, you know, fit to his scheme. So I, I like the flexibility. I like his uh, ability to, 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 to coach the position as a whole. And you mentioned it, the six interceptions is a market improvement from what he, he had his, freshman, true, uh, his richer freshman year. Um, 
continuing to improve on, on being more judicious with the football, I think is ultimately uh, the, the important goal for this season. But I think he understands his role much better in this offense. I, I think he understands more so that he can affect the game, not just by throwing the football, but, but by impacting it with his legs as well. You saw that towards the end of the season. He became a very adept short yardage goal line uh, runner. And uh, in that Michigan game in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, uh, they really fairly simplistic game plan. Florida spread them out with uh, formations and forced Michigan to defend them either by putting an extra uh, safety back in, w- in which that uh, allowed uh, Florida to run the football with the quarterback or, you know, dedicate a guy up into the, the box and leaving single coverage on the outside. And then they were utilizing a lot of the quick passing game in order to beat uh, one-on-one coverage. So I think that, uh, one, schematically, this coaching staff does a great job of uh, putting players in position to be successful. I think they also do a great job of minimizing deficiencies, which was one of the issues last year. The offensive line was not very good early in the season, but they did a great job of of trying to uh, compensate for the deficiencies there by utilizing a lot of the quick passing game and and, and getting uh, not allowing those defensive linemen to take advantage of of what was a, a... uh, deficiency for them. So they got better and better on the line as the year went on, but I really think this coaching staff has instilled a cultural change that has created confidence in that they, they feel like they can go out there and they can compete with anyone. That includes Georgia. I mean, they, they took Georgia uh, into the fourth quarter in a one-possession game, didn't ultimately win that game, but I think they gained some confidence just by, by going toe-to-toe with the team that everybody feels like is the best in the East, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that game plays out this year. I was asking on the other side of the ball, how are the Gators looking on defense this year? I think the defense is going to be the strength of this team. Uh, Florida's been stout on the defensive line for the last few years, and and, uh, that'll be the case this year as well. Uh, A deep uh, position for them where they can rotate a bunch of guys in. Jonathan Grenard transferred from Louisville. Uh, He had a chance to play in, in Todd Grantham, the defensive coordinator's scheme. Uh, when Grantham was at Louisville, uh, Jonathan Grenard's freshman year, so he's familiar with the the, uh, the scheme as a whole. But uh, he'll fill the the shoes of Jakai Polite, who's moved on to the NFL. Uh, Florida lost Marco Wilson at the corner spot last year due to injury. That forced true freshman Trey Dean to have to play a lot of downs. So uh, they get Marco Wilson back to complement C.J. Henderson. Trey Dean moves inside to the star position, which is one of the most important positions in this defense. Uh, so I, I feel really good about where they are. Uh, I do worry about the depth in the secondary a little bit. But um, I think this is, this is a team that can be really tough, uh, especially as we get into talking about Miami, a team that didn't do a lot on offense yet last year that has a redshirt freshman quarterback. Uh, it's going to be tough for the Canes to score against uh, what I think will be a pretty stout defense. Speaking of that quarterback situation in Miami, obviously, and going in as people, folks were wondering, Jaron Williams or um, Tate Martell, and like you like you said, it, it seems as though it's going to it's going to be Williams um, under first year head coach Manny Diaz. So um, talk a little bit about what the Hurricanes have have around Williams uh, as far as uh, helping him out. Well, I mean, I think this is uh, it's kind of similar to what Florida's situation is. Um, you know, Florida lost four or five starters from the offensive. Uh, Miami's going to be starting uh, a pair of freshmen at the tackle spot. At left tackle, they got a true freshman, and at right tackle, they got a redshirt freshman. So that's not ideal having to uh, start right away against a defense that's as, as good as what Florida's is. So I expect Todd Grantham to bring a lot of pressure, uh, give them a lot of different looks, and try to confuse them up front. Uh, but they do have some speed at the wide receiver position, and the running game uh, should be stout again for, for Miami as well. So um, yeah, it, it'll just be interesting to see how much pressure Todd Grantham wants to dial up on a quarterback in Jaron Williams who hasn't played a lot of snaps. And uh, I expect uh, he's always aggressive with his play calling, but I expect him to be e- even more aggressive as they uh, as they take on a young quarterback. You talk about the matchup uh, on, on that side of things. Uh, as far as the Florida defense against the Miami offense, how do you see the, the Florida offense um, stacking up against the Miami defense? This is as talented as an offense as Florida's had in a long, long time. I mean, you look at the skill position, Florida's about eight or nine deep uh, at the wide receiver spot. Um, running backs, they got a trio of guys that, that should be able to uh, be very pro- productive there. Uh, Michael P. Ryan 
is probably the headliner of that group of Malik Davis comes back from a, an injury last year and, and Damian Pierce had a nice breakout freshman year. So those guys should be pretty pretty uh, experienced and, and complement one another carrying the football. I think the tight ends, I mean the tight ends are a, a real uh, wild card for uh, X Factor for, for this offense and uh, Kyle Pitts is the guy that, that, uh, that the Dan Mullen and his offensive staff have used in a bunch of different ways including splitting him outside creating some mismatches lined up in the in the wide receiver spot, uh, much like they did with Cornelius Ingram when he was the coordinator here. So I, I think I think you'll see some of that. But uh, the question mark is, you know, if you can't protect up front, if you can't create running lanes, all that, that talent's for naught. And so can Felipe Franks get time to throw? As I mentioned, four or five uh, starters are gone from the offensive line last year. They do have some young guys that uh, are very talented, just unproven at this point. But I really think the, the key on the offensive line is Brett Hagee, uh, a guy that's been injured a lot over the last two seasons, but has the flexibility to play both at uh, right tackle where he'll start and also at center should they need him there. So uh, I think he's the guy at the end of the year you look back and see uh, he's got the potential to be a, an all-SEC type performer when it's all said and done. Chris, um, taking a look at this matchup between Miami and Florida, uh, and, ju- and just this series in general, I mean, uh, this is a game that hasn't been played since 2013. It's not played all that frequently. Uh, so um, from a Gators perspective, um, with you with you uh, providing that, uh, what's, your, what's your perspective on this matchup? Yeah, I mean, I'm a lifelong Gator fan. I grew up here in Gainesville going to all the games since I was, you know, four or five years old. Uh, my parents are both from Miami, so uh, interestingly enough, uh, I, I've attended a bunch of Miami-Florida games over the years, both here in Gainesville and in the Orange Bowl back in the day. So uh, it was a big rivalry that uh, I, I clearly had a lot of disdain for the Hurricanes, as is the case with older Gator fans, but uh, the series went away on an annual basis after 1987. So unfortunately, uh, that's one of my big regrets about my time in Gainesville as a player, was that I never got an opportunity to play against the Hurricanes. In fact, we didn't play them the entire decade of the 90s. Um, it's recently been played here on a one-off situation, but the announcement about a home-and-home home series in 2024 and 2025 is a start, and I hope it's a, a game that gets played more frequently because um, there was a time where the Florida, Florida State-Miami games with one another uh, determined not only the supremacy in the state, but it was... Uh, uh, de- determine you know who who some of the, the the prominent teams nationally were. So I hope this is a game that uh, we can get to play a little bit more frequently. It's a game that Florida has a ton of fans down in the uh, South Florida area, big alumni base down there, a great uh, fertile ret- recruiting area. So Florida playing down in South Florida is an advantage, uh, more so not only just to to uh, renew the rivalry, but just to have a presence down there with some guys that uh, that yeah, have obviously- a lot of talent in that area that they'd like to like to uh, get some exposure to. Thoughts on uh, these neutral site matchups? I believe this is a Camping World Stadium and uh, Week Zero as a, as a concept in general. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been. I think it's going to be something that starts to maybe go away a little bit because we've seen so much scheduling out of conference with home and home games, which which is important. I mean, fans are tired of paying season ticket prices for games against FCS opponents and and uh, and non Power Five teams, and I love the fact that we're going to get some great matchups. Uh, between Power Five conference teams in in their home stadiums, uh, Georgia has been a great example of what you can do with that home and home series against Notre Dame and, and getting them back in Athens this year. So I, I love that. I mean, I think it is uh, important to have some of these neutral site games. Uh, it gives you more flexibility with the scheduling and also puts some money in your pocket. But it, at the end of the day, I think the health of, of the college football game as a whole is dependent on, upon getting more fans out to the stadium um, and, and that only happens if you're, you're, you're bringing good opponents into the uh, into your home stadium so uh, hopefully that's going to continue to be a trend that we, we see more of as the years uh, go on Absolutely um, Chris I know you're running short on time we, we certainly appreciate you know, your time talking about this matchup we'd love to have you back on later in the season uh, and catch up and talk some more college football um, but for our listeners go ahead and tell folks where they can follow you on Twitter Yes my Twitter account is uh, at Chris Doring C-H-R-A-S-D-O-E-R-I-N-G 
and uh, look forward to another season in the studio with uh, Dari Noka and Gene Chizik. We're on Friday nights with the preview shows and all day Saturday and Saturday night with our uh, triple header that appears on the SEC Network. Absolutely. Thanks Thanks so much, Chris. We'll, we'll catch up again soon. That sounds good, man. We'll, we'll touch base later in the year. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a great honor to have him on. Thank you, Bubba, always. I'm bowing to you. Um, I know we have some other big guests coming on, which we'll talk about um, later, but uh, very happy to have him on. And uh, guys, with Week Zero, uh, it's here. And what do you think about You want to talk about the matchups a little bit and then go to our next guest? Yeah, there's only a couple of FBS matches to yep. talk about, but uh, they're good ones. Um, you got uh, Florida versus Miami uh, in Orlando from Camping World Stadium, neutral site. That's going to be cool. Uh, that's going to be uh, 7 o'clock on ESPN Saturday night. Um, actually going to be on ESPN, the ACC Network, and the SEC Network. It's going to be a triple cast. Uh, so you have Florida, Miami, and then in the night cap on CBS Sports Network, you have Arizona, Allen, Hawaii. So uh, a couple of really good games there. Uh, also in the FCS ranks this weekend, you got uh, Villanova, who's typically an FCS power, at Colgate, that'll be a 12 p.m. Uh, start on CBS Sports Network. And then uh, Stanford will take on FCS uh, Perennial Power, Youngstown State. Uh, that's the neutral site game in Montgomery at 3 p.m. on ESPN. So two good FCS games, two good FCS games uh, to occupy your day Saturday as we uh, get a, a little sneak peek into the uh, 2019 college football season. I mean, pretty much we talked about it, man. You got Florida. Miami, Arizona, Hawaii, and then a couple of good FCS games with Villanova, Colgate, and uh, Sanford, Youngstown State. So, uh, and Bubba's having night. everybody over. If you're a Pirate fan, come over. Bubba's cooking like chicken for everybody. So come on out uh, to Bubba's house in China Grove, and uh, we're going to like have a big party Pirate Nation style. Yeah. My, my huge house, well, we'll, we'll move that to Village Park. <laughs> All right, well. If it's a big and successful, then we can just move it there, and that'll be it's Bubba's house. So it's gonna be great. All right, guys. Speaking of great, we had a chance, uh, Bubba. Um, nice uh, get as well. This next guest, we always brag about how great Bubba does, and uh, very excited to have him on the podcast. Yeah, college football coaching veteran of more than forty years. Um, spent time with with the likes of Philip Fulmer and Dabo Sweeney, to name a couple. Um, I also spent some time with Mac Brown at um, North Carolina in his first stint uh, when they built that program up from uh, from back to back one win seasons to a ten win team. So um, right now, let's catch up with college football coaching veteran um, Dan Brooks. We're right here in the heart of August, um, college football season is upon us, and we're just a couple weeks away from opening day, and we're very excited to get to have now a guy who spent more than 40 years in the business, uh, Coach Dan Brooks. And Coach, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Glad to be uh, getting a chance to visit with you guys. Absolutely. I'm very excited to catch up. Um, and Coach, uh, I know back in the day, uh, you, you were originally from North Carolina and you attended App State um, back in the late 60s. Um, so can you talk about your, your high school years and uh, what led you to uh, Boone? Well, I was, I was a very small school, and Sam went up right there out of high school, and then uh, went up there in, on freshman ball and got hurt. So I wasn't in Boone very long. Uh, my wife's actually an Appalachian graduate, but we both went there. and So I got hurt and uh, wasn't a real smart 18-year-old. I quit and went home, and uh, Vietnam War was going on, and I had a low draft number in those days. You had draft numbers, and so... I uh, went in the military for three years and came back out and went to Western Carolina and played and got hurt again. And then uh, my college coach said, I hadn't had a chance to visit with you enough. I'm going to make a coach out of you. So uh, when I grew up and in those days, you just said, yes, sir, and went about your business. So went about it from all, all the way from that day until I retired. Coach, which, uh, which branch of the service did you serve in and did you see any 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 time in Vietnam? No, we didn't. I, I was in the Army, uh, but that was kind of the phase downtime when I went through. I was part of a Special Forces uh, Special Operations Detachment, and they sent us to Okinawa. We were going on to Vietnam, and about the time you guys remember, you young guys remember, you studied in history the William 
Cali stuff and all that. And they pulled all special forces out of Vietnam. And uh, so I spent that three months on Little Island out in the ocean, Okinawa. Wow, okay. And well, terminated from there. So. Now, uh, Coach, uh, I know you were at Western Carolina from 73 to 76. Right. When did uh, when did Bob Waters uh, arrive there? Because I know he was there in the 80s. Was was that uh, just prior to him? Or? No, Coach Waters actually it was my coach. He's, he's okay. The reason I'm in this business, in my opinion, him and the other coaches there, Bob Sutton and Don Powers. But but uh, Coach Waters' first season at Western Carolina was 1969, and okay. uh, Bobby Waters was a guy that people might remember. Older people as a old shotgun quarterback played for the San Francisco 49ers behind John Brody, and uh, then got into coaching college football and was the head coach at Western from '69 to '88. Great man, way ahead of his time throwing the football. So um, after your time at Western Carolina, and talk, talk about your path into coaching, how you decided to uh, pursue college coaching. Well, like I could say, and uh, I played in the fall of '73. I got out of the army in December of '72, and uh, went to Western for spring practice in '73, and played that fall. And then in the spring of '74, got my knee torn all up, everything in it, and then tried to rehab and come back in the fall '74 and got hurt again. And, and the doctors told me I probably shouldn't worry about trying to play anymore. And uh, because of injuries, and so uh, that's when Coach Waters called me in to sit down. And I actually, you know, you still don't know what you want to do. You want to play ball, but Coach Waters said, "I'm gonna make a coach out of you." So I was a student assistant coach. In those days, you didn't have enough people. Now they got so many people running around, but you didn't have enough people. So I was a student assistant coach on the defensive side, and actually physically went and scouted the other team that we were gonna play. So. My first year coaching, I only saw one game, and that was the last one. And after your time at Western Carolina, what what was your next stop? Because I know, um, I know, you, there in the '80s, you spent some time um, on, I guess, Charlie Pell's staff, and and then Galen Hall at Florida. Right. I uh, I left Western and thought I wanted to be a high school coach the rest of my life, and uh, and told some people that, and Coach Waters wanted me to stay in GA one more year. And I thought, no, I was going to go coach in high school the rest of my life. And so went to Kings Mountain, North Carolina, and coached uh, seven years. I was assistant two, and then uh, came the head coach way too young, an athletic director, 26 years old. And so we were fortunate, had some very good players, and a guy you guys may remember in that area, but I had a guy named Kevin Mack, played the tailback at, at, for me, and then he played at Clemson and played for the Cleveland Browns for many years the old Bynum and Matt deal at uh, the Cleveland Browns. And then another guy that came over y'all's way played at A.L. Brown in Kannapolis. After I left Kings Mountain, he went to Kannapolis. His dad was a minister and moved. And so he only was in Kannapolis one year, but people associate him with A.L. Brown in Kannapolis. But uh, he was in Kings Mountain when I coached there. Left Kings Mountain after the 82 season and went with... Uh, Charlie Pell at the University of Florida as a part-time guy. And uh, a year later, I got on full-time. And so from 84 until 2016, I was full-time at that level. So um, that connection, or how did you in, actually end up um, going to Florida with Coach Pell? Uh, um, I know he had obviously been at Clemson prior to that for a couple seasons and had an awful lot of success. So was that a connection that you had made when you were at Kings Mountain and he was at Clemson? Or It was. He uh, Some of the assistants, and then um, they recruited my school hard for Kings Mountain, that's right there on the North Carolina, South Carolina border. And uh, so they recruited our school hard and got to know most of their staff and so I went down and worked for a football camp some, and then after Coach Pell left and, and uh, Danny Ford took over, I still went down and worked some of their camps and that kind of thing, and then uh, got to know them, and they had an opening. This is a long time ago, but each side of the ball, offense and defense, used to have one guy that was a part-time guy, 
and you could do everything except go recruit. And uh, so they had a guy that left, actually went to the NFL, and, and so he hired me. And then that year in the 1982, they changed the rules, and you couldn't have that part time anymore. So I owe Charlie Bell for having a master's degree because he brought me to Florida, and then I ended up having to go to grad school. And uh, like I said, for a year, got my master's, got hired full time in the fall of '84. Yeah, oh, all took over. Right. Um, just looking at looking at some of the coaches you had the opportunity to work work with and under um, and the likes. I've already mentioned Charlie Pale and Galen Hall, but then you had um, obviously your next stop was at North Carolina with Mac Brown, then then Philip Fulmer at Tennessee for a decade and a half, and then of course Dabo at Clemson. Uh, talking about your time in, in Chapel Hill with Mac Brown uh, when you guys arrived there, um, your first couple seasons one win seasons but you quickly built the program up six seven nine and then ten wins in your final year there um what do you recall about that process it was really fun for me guys to help turn the thing around so being a, growing up there obviously and then being a high school coach too you kind of like one of them so you could go in the school and relate to a lot of people and i just knew so many coaches in north and south carolina because like i say with king's mountain being out there on the line we used to scrimmage some schools in South Carolina. And uh, Bruce Wallace, that was so successful down at Northwestern all those years, and I got to know him and that kind of thing. So it was a, a great experience just to turn the thing back because we, we weren't very good. We, and then Coach Brown kicked off the best player we had on the team, and we went one and ten again. And it was really hard recruiting. It's funny, a little story, but Charlie Pell's one of them guys that he worked for. He was just great guy, and like I say, when they fired Coach Pell and Galen Hall took over, Galen was great, he worked for also, but phone rings when you're one in ten trying to go out and recruit, he answered and it started Pell, and he wanted to know how I was doing, I said, Coach, I'm all right, he said, well, what's the old dog do when it gets wet? I said, Coach, I ain't much in the mood for jokes, we're just one in ten, and trying to go recruit some good players, and he told me, he said, check it off and go to work, and hung the phone up, that was him, though, you know? We just call, let you know you think about it. He said, shake it off and go back to work. So we went <laughs> recruited, and Coach Brown made us redshirt all those guys. And guys that went 1-10 in 10 ended up winning 10 games and playing Alabama in the Gator Bowl my last year there. That was a lot of fun. Very, very satisfying. Back to, to North Carolina. And uh, did that surprise you? Did you think he wanted to get back into coaching after after Texas and working for ESPN? And uh, – it kind of surprised me a bit, and uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it didn't me. I, I thought Coach Mike wanted to get back into it. He's a good football coach. I don't know. I wasn't with him at Texas. We stayed in touch over the years. Very good friend. I consider him a dear friend. And actually, have you know, spoken with him and some of the staff that he's hired to go back. But I said, I don't want to move anymore, and I don't, you know, I've done it. I, I love it, but uh, not going to get back on the road do all those kind of things. But I think he's the right guy. He'll go recruit and uh, uh, that kind of thing. So I knew that he wanted to get back, and he got close on a couple. But his wife, uh, Miss Sally, is from down there, and she really didn't want to go a whole bunch of other places. But she was happy to go back home to Chapel Hill. So uh, that's where he met her when he was the head coach there the first time. So uh, uh, it didn't surprise me. Uh, I think being out of it that long, you know, if it's much longer, you're probably not going to get back in. And, and uh, you know, y'all mentioned all those coaches, but I was very blessed because he worked for Mike Brown. He goes to Texas, wins the national championship, worked for Phil Palmer, and he won one at Tennessee, and, and that was winning it. So the last three guys I worked for won a national championship. So I've been very fortunate. Um, that Tennessee staff. When they won the national championship, what was that like being a part of that with 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 Philip Former and the T Martin, the quarterback, and and just experiencing being a part of a national championship team? I think both of them that I was fortunate enough to be at two different places and win it. But the common thread is a bunch of coaches and players that did not care who got the credit. You didn't hear a bunch of guys walking around. Well, I recruited this guy or I signed this guy, and you didn't have a bunch of players. Well, that was my tackle. He just piled on. You just you didn't have that. You know, you, 
you didn't have a bunch of ego guys. Um, I was with John Chavis and and uh, Steve Caldwell for a long time at Tennessee, and then uh, Larry Slade came in and joined us right after we won that. But uh, our offensive staff, you know, David Cutcliffe and those guys, you just had a whole bunch of guys that nobody cared. If you didn't have the great players in your area, go help somebody else and whoever signed them. But uh, you just didn't have a, it's a special group. And when you have guys like T. Martin and you have an Al Wilson was the linebacker, he was the, the catalyst of that defense. You know, you didn't have to worry about the locker room. You didn't have to worry about those things. And then you go to Clemson and you had very much the same thing with Ben Bowlware and a guy from out there in North Carolina, Carlos Watkins, were seniors when we won it at Clemson. But very much the same kind of thing, a very unselfish staff. And guys y'all probably know from North Carolina State and North Carolina, Robbie Caldwell was there, Danny Pierman from Charlotte. And of course, Woody McCorvey was with Coach Ford the first time at Clemson. So you just got a bunch of good people that nobody cares. And, and it the head coach, too, because if the head coach walks in and, well, you're not signing anybody, you're not doing it. So, that Coach Former and Coach Winnie, neither one, that wasn't the case. Hey, we're going to sign the best players. We don't care where they are as long as you're working and doing your area. So, I think that was a common thread. But, obviously, you got to have good players. But when you got a bunch of people that nobody cares who get the credit, I think that's the best toward success. Coach Brooks Coach talking about. There, I'm sorry, there, Kyle. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, what what makes Coach Sweeney? What makes Dabo so special there at Clemson? I mean, he he's not only. I mean, he's a great coach, and he, but he's it, it's obvious there's something more to him than just being a great coach. He he's got a very uh, charismatic personality that just comes across anytime I hear him in an interview or see him on TV. I think you're exactly right. There is more to him, and and I think exactly what it is. I worked for him eight years, and. We stayed in touch. Uh, I go down there once in a while, watch practice, or do that kind of thing. Stay in touch because about all the guys that I was coaching when I left have gone. They're all millionaires now, but um, uh, still some guys there that we recruited from up in that in our area, like you say, Cornell and Tanner Muse from South Point and Justin Foster from Crest, and a couple of guys from Tennessee uh, also. But he just when you ask that question, it's so real. What you guys see is the real deal. A lot of guys, I think, questioned when Terry Don Phillips made him the head coach, is he tough enough? Is he, you know, that kind of deal, and, and there's no question he is. Y'all don't see behind the closed doors that uh, his discipline's unbelievable, but he's so real with them. He tells them when they do good, he tells them when they do bad, he don't beat around the bush, he just He's so real with you as a coach and with them. He's, I'm going to hire good coaches and let you coach. And and uh, he's not over here in the middle of your business trying to coach your guys or that kind of thing. But Jeff Scott was his GA, and he made him the receiver coach. And look at the success he's had. But he's just a very real person with whoever he's dealing with. And uh, he and his wife might be the givingest people God put on the earth. They, they make a lot of money, but they sure give a lot back and give away. Coach, one of the key cogs on that coaching staff and uh, one and someone that you had the opportunity to work very closely with, obviously, is uh, defense coordinator Brent Venables. Um, what a tremendous job that he's done. Um, and it always cracks me up to, to see his personal get-back coach on the sideline, but uh, that guy gets a workout during the game. Uh, but uh, taking a look at Coach Venables, uh, do you, I mean, obviously you can't – speak for him and there's only so much you can say uh, but um, do, do you think that coach Venables is someone that um, could see a head job in his future do you think he's satisfied with the excellent gig he has being a defensive coordinator no Brent Venables could be a head coach he could already be a head coach but I think he loves what he's doing and I don't think he could just be the head coach and not coach he's so into coaching and people see that on the field stuff there's not any of that for show he thinks he can make adjustments. He's been in his own package for so long in Oklahoma and Clemson. He thinks he can make adjustments all the way up to a ball snap. So he's out there trying to tell the safety to move six inches here or back up three steps. Or It's all about adjustments. And when he first came, 
I've always been a signal guy. I signal for Carl Torbush at North Carolina and Kevin Steele at Clemson and John Chavis at Tennessee. And you can't signal for that guy because he waits so late, tries to make so much adjustment, so he does his own. But he could be a head coach, but I think he's really happy doing what he's doing. He's got one son on the team, got another one committed coming to the team. And uh, I think he and his wife really love living there. And uh, I don't see him going anywhere. I mean, Coach Twenty is a great guy to work for. And I, I think he'll be there as long as he wants to be. And sure, you have those aspirations, but I think he's happy coaching. I don't know. If, I don't know if Brent could do it if he wasn't coaching his guys every day. I still got farm over in the mountains of North Carolina and get over there some and that kind of deal. So, like you say, you just probably can reach out and find out. But most of the time I am available, I don't know when you talk about the next couple of weeks or whatever, but uh, obviously Clemson opens two weeks from today, and we got a football game a week from this Saturday with uh, Florida and Miami, I guess, kicking the whole thing off. But Clemson yes, sir. plays Georgia Tech on that new ACC network two weeks from today. So it's about yep. here, guys. To review yes, uh, week one of college football, that would be great. Right. Right. Okay. That'll be fine. All right. All right. Well, we really appreciate it, Coach. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, so, uh, have an excellent weekend, and we'll catch up soon. Okay. You're welcome. Just just shoot me a text, and I'll let you know what we're into. All right. It sounds, sounds good. Take care, Coach. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Coach. That was a, a very entertaining interview, and I had a chance to go back and listen to that, uh, guys, that uh, – that he is uh, a really good coach, and you, you think about all the – he must be a really good coach when you hear those names of the people that picked him to be on the staff. He can't be a bad coach, right? I mean, you hear all those, like, four to five coaches. Uh, you, you wouldn't think those guys would hire bad people, no. So. Yeah. <laughs> you, think, you think about it, all, uh, all three of those uh, won, won national titles, and uh, two of those um, – he, he was – part of those staffs, um, 1998 at Tennessee and then, I guess, oh, yeah. 20, 2016 at Clemson. Yeah. So it's incredible uh, to have two national championship rings and to have them that far apart on two totally different staffs. Really cool. And uh, we we love having uh, – there's something special about having these older coaches that they have such experience. You can just sit there and listen to them for hours, and uh, we appreciate – uh, he gave us a long time to be on, and I certainly love to have him back on very soon. Hey, guys, uh, do you want to talk about the uh, lines uh, for the football games that we – I know there's some interesting lines as far as people – I'm not a gambling man, but I am always fascinated to hear about – let's start with East Carolina. What do you think about the line that you're hearing now, guys? Uh, it's down to 17, uh, yeah. up to 21. Uh, it seems fair, actually. I know not some Power fans would want to hear that, but um, quite honestly, after what they did to us last year, uh, they got a lot of talent back on defense. I, obviously, I want to win the game, and, and I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities. I do think Coach Houston's got to finish teaching these guys how to practice before they can learn how to win. <laughs> to be quite honest with you, if we lose by 17 and play well, uh, I, I really was feel pretty good about the future. Absolutely. Oh, there's no, no doubt about it. I mean, I think when it's all said and done, I think the line can go down a little bit more, maybe to uh, 14 points. What do you think, Bubba? I think two touchdowns is where it's going to stay. That's my prediction. Yeah, I, I would quite honestly be surprised if it, if it made it down that, that low, um, but who knows? I mean, we still we still have a, a little over a week into the game, so if if uh, heaven forbid something happened and uh, and there was an NC State player that suffered a key I mean, a key player that suffered an injury in the next few days or something, then then uh, it may get down to that point or below. But uh, I think it will probably stay close to where it is now. Well, something a little mafiaish about that, Bubba. Heaven forbid something happens to one of your players. Like they take like a knee goes out or something like that. You know, heaven forbid your quarterback shoulder gets hurt. No, 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 We're going no, to uh, no Nancy Kerrigan, uh, Tanya Harding uh, okay, situation right. here. Right, like, the, players sure. gonna be on, the players will be on Hillsborough Street and 
all of a sudden you see the uh, the quarterback. Oh God, what was that? Some dude beating like an all in black and. Why? <laughs> yeah. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, that's been a long time ago. Well. Wow. Oh. Uh, yeah. So. Anyway, they uh, in fact there were there were some people that really were into Tanya. <laughs> Starting over Nancy Kerrigan, I just thought that was interesting. So, yeah. Uh, so, w- was it Jeff Gadouli or something like that? And like, exactly, oh, exactly. Uh, something like Cincinnati that. quarterback Gino Gadouli. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> he was the hit man. Let's talk about the other. Uh, are there other games that like really come to mind when? It, and there's tons of games, but are there ones that you guys picked out? Um, as far as the lines that are really... Well, I mean, you were talking about some lines earlier that you found. There. Yeah, the some of these were not so surprising, but just um, I saw some quotes by the commissioner of the American, Mike Oresco, and opening weekend is a huge opportunity for our league. Um, you have Cincinnati, who beat UCLA last year out there. Um, the Bruins are coming to Nippert Stadium, and... And so, um, with that being the case, and the, the Bearcats are a three-point favorite, and I actually thought it might be a little bit larger favorite than that. Um, but you also have Memphis; uh, they're a, I think five and a half point favorite over Ole Miss, who is uh, coming to the Liberty Bowl. And then you have Houston uh, making the making the trek to um, Norman to take on the Sooners. Um, Lincoln Riley and company uh, are a twenty-four and a half point favorite. Uh, and that surprised me a little bit. I would have probably guessed that that line would have been a little closer to 17, like the East Carolina NC State line. So uh, I think right now, uh, based on uh, what I know, I, I take the Cougars and the points. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, not a bad pick. I mean, I, I like Oklahoma to win the game, but I definitely think you could. And then Holgerson could cover that line for sure. Um, something else, guys, kind of st- going away from the, the matchups, something that's been very cool to see in recent days is something the the university and the athletic department, um, they're doing this through the UBE, so piratewear.com, also the store on ecupirates.com, and I believe uh, Dowdy Student Stores, the, the vault collection, uh, where we're unveiling uh, merchandise with logos from different eras. And they're they're currently on the the logos, the three main marks from the seventies, and the the script pirates, and then also the pirate head, where the you have the sword or knife in the mouth, and then also uh, also the uh, interlocking EC logo, which is uh, a cool mark. So uh, I know I placed an order, um, I guess it was yesterday, for um, the the purple hoodie with the script pirates. And also had the pirate head, so those two marks on that one one uh, piece of apparel, and uh, look forward to wearing that this fall yeah, once it's cool enough. I've always been a, uh, a fan of the uh, the pirate of the pirate head with the cutlass and its mouth, and uh, I also like the script pirates. So uh, those are uh, two uh, two logos that I wouldn't mind ordering. And uh, you should see with this from the vault collection what will be next. Uh, I would assume the the uh, the PD logo, as I call it, the kind of uh, marching or running PD that was used for so long in the '90s within the flying ECU oh, yeah. that was used in the uh, late '80s and early '90s. Uh, I would imagine those logos will be released soon, and uh, I expect they're going to sell really well when they release the oh, yeah. Bowl, Liberty Bowl era uh, PD and uh, flying ECU logo stuff. You remember in the late '90s when they finally had a different. PD, they called him Pedro. Oh that? yeah, well that, that logo was well that really Late wasn't 90s. a different PD. The PD was PD was still PD. You're just talking about the the logo or, or the, yeah. the Pedro logo. And I that yeah that logo is still uh, is still used some um, sparingly. Uh, it's yeah, on that, our basketball practice facility. Yeah, that was 1998. So I guess you you had PD as the primary mark. Or, uh, from I guess what eighty three or eighty four to ninety eight, and then in ninety eight you had the, you had the new font uh, and the the ECU Saber logo on the yeah. on the football helmets, and then and then that that uh, pirate head that you just referenced. Well, I think that I, some people were like so anti PD, but 
far as me having kids, they absolutely love PD, like PD, PD, PD. So I see there's more going for more of a kids audience, I think. Um, and that's why they did it. But I have no problems with the, the PD. And that would be great to have that back. I think, uh, by well, the way. We redesigned the PD a few years ago. And they, uh, and they unveiled him in the game with the PD that we're using now. But initially they screwed up the color of his, uh, skin on the costume and he looked like he was pink yeah. and sunburn or something. It was so yeah. terrible. <laughs> in the smile, they, they toned down the smile a little bit. I think what they did was just made his beard thicker or covered up some of it. But initially yeah. the, the <laughs> smile was, was just terrifying and he looked like he had, uh, I don't know, maybe you've been stayed at the beach too long and <laughs> had a bit of a sunburn. Well, I yeah, remember I think, that. Well, I think I that was a that. 2008 UTEP game, maybe. Yeah, that sounds something right. Like, something like that. Yeah, it's been a while. I do remember that. But uh, it wasn't 08 ask... UTEP. It wasn't 08 UTEP. 08 UTEP closed out the season. Um, right. Yeah. Well, so I think it was late in the year that it, it was, was unveiled. It was. It's it kind, was kind of uh, unusual UTEP. timing. Yeah, I want to ask you guys about as far as the uh, – I want to have one game. I think we talked about this, but I want to mention it again. We need to have one game where we have a throwback jersey, um, and we could do it one game a year. What um, throwback jersey do you want? Uh, right. well, I mean, the, the uniform that we wore from 1989 to, to 1997. Um, and, yeah, the Peach Bowl. Yeah, well, yeah, and people refer to it as a Peach Bowl, but um, – so the, the uniform from that era, and that's the one that would immediately come to mind, and I think I would probably go with. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what else you would do. Um, it's too it's too recent. I would say that like to do throwback to like the conference USA championship uniform. I, I, I say that it's been ten and eleven years. If you can how believe about, that. Um, how about let's give some love for Terry Gallagher, a friend of the podcast. What about like well, the you know seventy eight? That yeah, I mean, I just don't think enough people. McCare. Well, not no, that's not right. I mean, tear away uh, jerseys. <laughs> you know, if you if you go with the late seventies or you go with the early eighties uniform, seventy eight or eighty three, certainly there will be a, a group of fans that will remember that fondly. But that same group of fans that will remember that fondly will also remember the Lewis Logan era Peach Bowl, Liberty Bowl era uniforms. But you'll have a whole other generation that will also get into that. So I think that's going to have more mass appeal. Well, hey, we got. Let's talk to Gilbert and uh, Ryan Robinson in Houston because the uh, we could do that. Honor the Peach Bowl team. Our good friend Mark Washington, and we got a lot of teams, a lot of guys that played on that podcast, um, played on the team that have been on our podcast. And it'll be 30 years in just two years. We'll have the 30th anniversary of the Peach Bowl year. Yeah, not, and I mean, you know, and, and not only the Peach Bowl team, but, you know, the, the, the Liberty Bowl team in 95 and all the same uniforms. I mean, I, look, I'm not taking anything away from the Peach Bowl team. God knows they deserve all the accolades they get. They're the greatest team in the history of East Carolina Power Football. But sometimes I think we forget about some of these other teams, like that Liberty Bowl team in 95. So, so you know, they wore, they wore the same uniforms. So let's, let's honor, you know, every player that wore those uniforms during that, uh, Bill Lewis, Steve Logan era. Sounds good to me. I, hey, I have no problems with that. Hey, guess what? When we were wearing those uniforms, we win a lot of games, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you, and as far as that 91 uniform that we referenced, and you, you know folks would go just go absolutely crazy if um, we come through the purple haze and have that on. Uh, maybe say we didn't warm up in – in those, uh, but uh, folks would love it either way, um, whether it was a, a secret or not. Yeah, and it's tough. To, it's, it's hard to do in, in 2019, 2020, whenever. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to keep things like that a, a complete secret nowadays with social media and eyes and cameras and phones everywhere. Unless they waited to give the <laughs> unless they waited to give the uniforms right before. They went out. Uh, right? Then you got equipment people. I mean, there's still a way to keep yeah. it out. It's hard to keep it on That would be cool. Hey, by the way, um, before we go, i got to throw another thing at you. What about um, hypotheticals here about 
Uh, there's a lot of been talk about over the last month or two about potential. I, know, I think we know how it's going to happen now. But what about ways that people could, uh, people, the team could come into the stadium? Do you have a cool, what about you, Kyle? Do you have a cool way that Mike Houston could come in? Uh, do you have Purple well, Haze playing or do you have a different song? What do you do? Um, so what you could do just to be different. You could like turn all the lights out in the stadium if it's a night game and just completely black. And then uh, on the scoreboard, you, you light it slowly. You like bring it up from dim lit to bright light, and uh, and then start playing Dancing Queen, and um, then have uh, the players come out with Coach Houston and all in like some really like elaborate like clothing over top of their uniforms, like costumes. And come out the dancing queen and uh, dance around on the field and then rip their clothes off to unveil their uniforms. And that really would throw the opponent off. <laughs> is it an episode of Glee or is it a pirate ball? <laughs> oh my God. So they well, throw them off. So our opponents would know what to think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What do you think, so about sounds, it? you like that idea? It sounds more like a Broadway musical than, yeah. than it does. Oh, you like that? Spirit yeah, I'm, I, I'm just thinking about I'm thinking about Remember the Titans. Uh, when, oh yeah, when, when they started that. dancing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, what do you think, uh, Bubba? Uh, I think it's pretty much good how it is. I, one thing that I would like to see um, is it's kind of the situation uh, that we that we put ourselves in in terms of the way we all these all all those years ago back in the early 2000s and the way we chose to do things at the Murphy Center and we don't want to be, we, we, you know, so we don't want to beat a dead horse there, but uh, it would be nice to have like what you have in the boneyard end of the stadium where you have those, that natural tunnel where the team could yeah. enter. So you didn't have to have an inflatable skull and, and uh, the inflatable skull is fine, but we shouldn't have, we should not have had to resort to that. So, um, that we had something like that that has to come out of, so we weren't just coming out of the door of a building. Y'all remember yeah. the uh, y'all remember the boat uh, Skip had during his era? Yeah, um, I remember oh, that yeah. well because I remember the construction of it taking place uh, and during during the summer, and um, folks like Tom Andreski um, or Blue Water Pirate, as he's known on the message boards. Uh, but the locals there in Greenville were putting pictures on the message boards and uh, and so forth. But um, I, I think one of the funniest things that I remember about that is I think it was when we were playing Houston right after we had been upset at NC State when we were ranking 15th. And we were still ranked um, there in the, the low 20s uh, with Houston coming to town. And um, unfortunately, we got beat pretty soundly in that game, uh, a couple touchdowns at least. Um, but I remember when we were coming out, there's a video that's on YouTube with one of our fans saying, saying, here we go, baby, and knock down that door. Uh, the door from the ship is, is, is one of those on a, just a guy's voice is pretty comical. I haven't seen that. All right, guys. I think it's time to put this thing to bed. All right, guys. Well, uh, Bubba, I know we got some great guests coming up, and uh, we'll have. Uh, by the way, folks, thank you for making Fifty Pirates in Fifty Days a huge success. Bubba, we got some great ones coming up, right? Yeah, we'll continue to talk to some guys from the Clarence Stasovich era. Uh, we'll also, uh, you remember the Hart twins? Uh, we'll catch up with Darren and David Hart, uh, a couple of guys who um, didn't have the most talent in the world, and they, were, but in terms, so. They're talented, but they're, you know they were five nine, five ten, or what what have you. Um, they're a little undersized, so they didn't have the offers that that some guys had. But they came to East Carolina and certainly proved themselves. Darren Hart was a freshman All American back in nineteen ninety. You know, the reason they both came to East Carolina is because they were Dave Hart's sons. Right. Yeah. Oh right. <laughs> they were. <laughs> It's starting rumors here. Huh? Yeah, of course, they yeah. would never do anything like that. Da Darren Hart and Dave Hart Jr. Is that oh, a, is that's right. Dave Hart Jr. and Darren. Is that not right? <laughs> but, um, but no, da Darren Hart, uh, when, when I think of Darren Hart's career, 
and this is a play that we discuss with him um, in the interview that you'll hear. Um, but but Darren had that pick six um, in a Liberty Bowl game against Stanford um, that was decided by six points, um, and that was the Pirates' only touchdown in that in that uh, memorable win. So, um, so 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 that's some that we're talking with, and then as far as just our general podcast. An excellent guest, a guy that's uh, extremely well-known, and we really look forward to catching up with him. Timmy B., uh, Tim Brando, uh, will, will be joining the show here in the coming days. Yeah, we've got to get our act together with Timmy B. Gets on here. We can't, we can't have these Mickey Mouse podcasts we put out with Timmy <laughs> B. On the show. We've got to get back in form, guys. Season's coming up here. Uh, we've got to get our game with Coach Houston. You know, we're going to have to get him to come coach us up to Get us back in form and get us ready. We got Tim Brando coming on, the legendary Timmy B. The home. Hey, will he be? Will he be? Will he be calling us from the Chateau Brando? We're getting ready to find that. We'll find that out. Inquiry minds want to know. All right, guys. Report. That'd be great. Appreciate uh, you both for your hard work and your support uh, of the podcast to me personally. Thank you, guys, very much. For Kyle from the Greens Barber and Bubba Rosenbaum, I'm Dave Richmond for the Sports Objective Podcast. You've been listening to the Sports Objective Podcast. Join us next time as the guys will be objective, and the objective is sports.